Hey everyone, it's 7.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looks like February the 1st, 2022 years from something. And uh, I'm going to do my best today to uh, continue to lose what few friends I have. Not, I'm not going to do my best. I shouldn't say that. But it does tend to happen. It's, um, it's, it's, it's one of those job hazards, you know, like breakage. But this one's not too, uh, you know, full frontal assault. What I do want to do, I'm not going to go over the whole thing. I'm going to go over a little bit of uh, an article that a viewer sent me. And I want to thank the viewer who sent these links. They're really interesting. And sometimes articles are they're really good on a, a topic, a topical article, because most of the material that I have to get and pull from, it's either material that I'm having to, uh, in a sense, generate myself based on developing Bible study tools, um, sans the menorah, <laughs> Mazora, <laughs> and the menorah, um, or basically looking through establishment books and having to extract what I can that's believable um, or has even grains of truth in establishment books. And it's very daunting. It's really daunting. <laughs> um, and you know, the folks running things, they know that. And they actually supply us with uh, an endless stream of memes and articles that would presume to satisfy um, lives that are usually kept very busy to where uh, a lot of times we only have a certain amount of time to put into certain things. Uh, I think that's sometimes the case. I think more often than not, it's just people are uh, lazy and they have a lot of excuses. I've heard them all and um, I'm sorry, but I think that's typically the case. Anyways, it doesn't have to be the case. We can do better. We can get better, I hope. This is an article that, uh, actually, it's, <clears throat> this is, uh, again, I'm only going to be touching on little bits of it. From uh, a new manifesto to revise prevailing history and chronology. Very cool article. I'll have the link in the description. It's by somebody named Christopher uh, Fister. I have not looked into the etymology or origin of the last name. Um, so who knows? But, Really, what I'm going on, no matter who this is, whether they're controlled opposition, whether they're just an absolutely very honest, sincere person, I'm just going through and highlighting points that I think are important. Green are the ones that I mostly agree with. Red, maybe either disagree with or might be a point of contention. And then typically blue... Uh, highlighting would be references and actually he has a number of references um pretty decent ones you'll see um a little ways down which we probably won't get to here so for those who have uh watched bringing it all together my presentation that i released just a couple weeks ago um one of the the main thrusts of that was epistemology where our knowledge is derived how it's derived and uh, are the foundations that we're working from sound if we don't work from sound foundations on any given topic we can't hope to end up getting back sound conclusions, sound answers. 
This is why uh, over years um, of studies and going through permeations, I had to come to that point where you get to those foundations. You dig and you dig and you dig and you dig and you get to the foundations. And of course, by that point, you do realize, I hope, though it took me some time to realize that the, the foundation of every point of knowledge that we're working from that we hope to work from it has to be considered critically we cannot hold any sacred cows now before anybody says yeah but you work off of the idea that the bible is inspired well let me address that I work off the idea that the majority of the books that we call the Holy Bible are inspired. Uh, I don't claim that they all are. I think there's some bad stuff peppered in there. I have reasons that I give as to why I work off of that. Uh, we'll just call it an assumption. If people... If people put a claim out there and they don't in any way, shape, or form give you their, their reasoning for why they are working off that as an assumption, then I would say that that is problematic. Um, but I do have that. There is that assumption. Now, most other people know who have listened to enough of my uh, material that when I find things that don't comport with that assumption, I call them out. I at least highlight them. Now, if I highlight them and I say, but I think the reason might be this, rather than the reason is because it's all bunk. There could always be multiple reasons for any phenomenon that we find, for any evidence that we find. There always can be. And just because I have a particular perspective on, on a thing or point of view on a thing, I am not trying to convince you that it is the, uh, the only logical, acceptable point of view. That's important, too, because a lot of the people out there, I would say the majority of the people out there, that would stylize themselves as some sort of um, truth teller, whether it's in the uh, realm of Bible, um, faith in general, spirituality in general, that's one uh, genre or aspect of the truth. There, you know, there's also um, financial, there's political, there's social, there's a lot of scientific, scientific medical which kind of falls under scientific <laughs> it should <laughs> i don't know that it always does but yeah we should be willing always be willing to uh, look at these things that we assume which i always am willing to and i don't hide what my present assumptions are and again i know i'm being repetitive I certainly don't brush things under the rug when they don't look great for my particular perspective or point of view where I'm coming from. I would, would expect this from anybody who claims to be trying to um, help you come to an understanding of just what is. I'm not doing this from a place of authority like, uh, you know, a priest or a professor, um, simply somebody who spent a lot of time uh, looking at a lot of things, trying to reason things out, and here's where I'm at. Now, this is a really interesting article, actually, because he is, uh, it, again, a new manifesto to revise prevailing history and chronology. And it's a decent size article, and what I've read so far, and I am reading it quite slowly, because... 
I highlight as I go because I try to categorize things and get references and, and things like that. And sometimes, a lot of times, when I'm reading something, I check on the references as I go. And it does make things really slow going. I do want to start with some highlights here. I'll just go through the green ones, the red ones, talk about some things. And then I'm probably going to rabbit trail into another topic, which is important. It has to do with this. So the first agreeable point that he makes is uh, when he says criticism of history and chronology neatly divides into two distinct aspects, namely content dating. Ancient history in particular, but other historical narratives too, are problematic and riddled with falsehood on both counts. I'm sorry, content and dating, not content dating. Content and dating. And he does go into this quite a bit. And we can see that as an issue. The content issue is how verifiable is any claim. Not just the establishment claim. It can be a, a fringe claim. Um, how well can they back that up? Are there multiple sources from are there multiple sources from multiple different perspectives that don't necessarily have something to gain by not telling the truth? This is really important to, to backing that up. And of course, the other problem is dating. And there's a lot of reasons why dating is a problem. Anyways, the next point he makes is, he says, the indisputable clear historical timeline ends up being considerably shorter than generally assumed. That I can agree with simply because I've seen it. And if you start, if you start reasonably considering the possibilities of such a long timeline, and when I say that, let's just not consider, you know, the sort of millions or billions of years, let's say the evolutionist claims, which they cannot back up. They simply can speculate on. Um, and of course, a lot of their claims goes uh, back to the whole issue of foundations and epistemology. Um, how verifiable are their claims or the methods that they are using? That's something that Fomenko spent a good deal of time on in the early portions of his first book, History, Fiction, or Science. It's definitely something that we should probably spend a lot more time on rather than spending a lot of time on our own speculation. And I'm not saying I'm not guilty of that. I'm just saying that that would probably be one of the most productive ways that we could use our time concerning all of these matters of truth. Um, something else, really, this is, I, I think, something that should be considered. When you think about this, right? for any of you that understand that the New Testament, the Gospels specifically, let's just say um, you show Jesus' perspective in the Gospels, is specifically to Israel. And we're looking specifically at a redemption of a people who were cast off some time before that, centuries before that. We know that, you know, Judah had been kept in store for what was to uh, occur in, in his lifetime. And then there was to be a judgment of Judah. Now, when we consider timelines and kingdoms, and let's say Daniel's, uh, those two visions, the first one, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and the second, a vision that he had, both of them, I believe, were complementary visions because of the symbols that we see in the two. Um, one thing we see is this. If we track the the time that these kingdoms were kingdoms, and they had control uh, over the world, or at least control over the area that we're focused on in the Bible, which is Canaan and surrounding areas. These kingdoms, from Babel to uh, Mahdi and Paris uh, to Yun, 
they don't have extraordinary lifespans. Kingdoms in general, and we could also consider um, Asher, Assyria, at its height, which we can track uh, to a degree with the Bible also. Or, you know, Mitzram had a certain amount, of course, of strength. I don't know that they had anything hegemonic. I think the first kingdom that really did was Babel. That's why we see that progression in that statue in Daniel 2 and with the beasts in Daniel 7. Uh, also, Aram, which was one of um, Israel's closest relatives and neighbors. And their ark. Look at an ark of um, kingdom power and, and control of a particular kingdom, you know, a particular people, and how long they're able to maintain that to keep it. And those arks typically don't tend to go much longer than a few centuries as far as, you know, how much they're able to, to grab onto. I think it's because we're looking at an arc that reflects the fragility of the condition of man. We can see that also in the kingdom of Israel and Israel's uh, rise, their peak and their fall, which even though Israel was maintained as a nation for a very long time, then the northern kingdom was carried away, the Gal. Um, and then Judah was kept in store for a few centuries past that. They were never, they never were able to achieve the height that they once had under um, David and Solomon. And they even still had this a very strong two kingdoms for some time, even after they were broken apart and Rehoboam uh, was king of the south and Jeroboam of the north, and then there were ascensions from there. There was still, a, they still had a great deal of power for some time before they both eventually became, in Israel's case, they were just carried away. There were uh, incursions, of course, they had with Aram, and there were sometimes they were under the boot of Aram, and, and then with Ashur, Assyria. Um, Judah eventually just degraded so badly that they ended up becoming a vassal kingdom for a heck of a long time before then they were finally carried away. Okay. But their arc of being a powerful kingdom in control of a lot, uh, their, their own nation and uh, oftentimes nations around them, um, didn't last as long. Okay. Maybe a few centuries. And that seems to be the arc of most. And it seems to be uh, consistent based on, again, as I said, the fragility of or the, you know, peculiar nature and behavior of man. So to think that Judah's carried away after the coming of Christ and that literally because Everything stops by the time we get to those feet, and then there's uh, the vision is that crushing of, and then we, we see it again, that's in Daniel 2, and we see it again in Daniel 7, as the saints take control of the kingdom. That hasn't happened yet. The saints take control from that fourth, that final kingdom. Bit by bit, they take back this control. That's what we see in Daniel 7. That hasn't happened. So we would have to think that that fourth kingdom ha has been a kingdom for 2,000 years, which is insane. Even if you think of the third kingdom, which the third kingdom had to have uh, had its ascent before Christ came. I'll say Christ, it's easier. Just Before Christ came, um, they would have had to have had their ascent at that time, and then their descent couldn't have been that long after he was gone. Judah fell. They would have been uh, the little horn of that kingdom. Remember, there's a little horn in, in both the kingdom of Yun and this last kingdom, which isn't named. The last one's not named. Um, the third kingdom would have been the one in power who would have facilitated the carrying away of, of Judah then. And then they would have had their 
decline in a sense and the fourth kingdom its its incline probably not that long after all of this happened we've got to consider you know arcs of kingdoms and um you have to kind of wonder when you see the symbolism uh in daniel 2 of how the head is a finer or purer metal and as we get lower it's maybe a little less fine or a little less pure a little less strong metal in the sense of silver and then uh it says brass but it could more likely be just be um uh copper iron iron and clay okay now if that, if that's the case i think it's entirely reasonable then to think that the arcs of these kingdoms because of the uh, degradation of man's condition would be shortened as well which then if you're like me and you're coming from the perspective that these things are true these prophecies are true then those kingdoms lives couldn't nearly be as long as what it would take to fill the last two thousand years and that fourth kingdom has to still be in control with this final we see a last kingdom that's not it, it doesn't have that sort of uh, hegemony that the other kingdoms did we see it in revelation 13 and it springs up from the land i go into this in bringing it all together and why it springs up from the land but all the others are from the sea and so on and so forth um but as i said it doesn't particularly have its own hegemony and we can see that in the language used in revelation 13. it's not necessarily adding to the timeline because it's that fourth kingdom that's still in power so when he says the indisputable clear historical timeline ends up being considerably shorter than generally assumed i find that entirely agreeable entirely agreeable so much to the point to where uh, i know a lot of people still um people that appreciate let's say fomenko's work would still say there's been a thousand years added and I would tell you, based on everything that I've seen and read, thought about, and tried to put in context with everything I understand about the Bible, um, everything I understand about man, everything I understand about prophecy, and when certain kingdoms should have been in their ascension or their descension, I would say I don't think it could have been more than and one more thing before I finish that sentence. One more thing. You have to think about how long the people of Israel, Judah, altogether Israel, would be banished and punished. Their last prophet that came to them in a significant way, which would have been their greatest prophet, Jesus, Yusho. The punishment and banishment after that first off was um just a, a sort of rape of the land as he describes in matthew 24 and as we see reflected in, in other places and i think a bit in revelation there too would have been worse than anything that's ever been witnessed just like he said actually and then there would have been this time of again a banishment and we can see in like Ezekiel's 30, uh, 36 and 37 that there would be a bringing back to the land and refining, perfecting, and restoring the people there uh, after their captivity. But you have to think, how long really would that captivity have went? I mean, Israel was already uh, banished and, and sort of in their captivity or maybe banishment. We should just stick with that for a few centuries by that point in time, by the time Judah was finally cast out. How long should that really go? I mean, Judah, who had behaved, multiple prophets affirmed this, who had behaved worse than Israel, 
but they were kept in store because of the promise Yahweh made to David, which we see fulfilled in the Christ you show. Um, they were banished to Babylon for the, the, the offense of 490 years of not resting the land. One year out of every seven. Every seventh year the land rests. They didn't do that for 490 years. So they got banished for 70 years so the land could rest. 70 years. So you have to think, and I know some might respond like, yeah, but this is different. This was Jesus. They, they killed, they killed Jesus. This is different. Um, yeah, uh, they killed a lot of their prophets. Oh, but this is different. He was the, the son of God, the son of Yahweh. That makes it different. It makes it more serious than other prophets that they killed and other good men that they killed. But really, that was like the way I look at it. His death and, and rejection by the people was really just the straw that broke the camel's back. And I'm not trying to minimize it. But what I'm saying is there was a great accumulation of blood and blood guilt up to that point in time. I just happen to think, based on the way that I see Yahweh interacting, dealing with Israel and Judah throughout the Old Testament, that a couple thousand years of a banishment, first off, seems really extreme in comparison to the way I see him dealing with Israel and Judah before that. Secondly, I just have a hard time believing in an ark of the last kingdom of the earth being that long, when none of the other ones can sustain an ark more than a couple few centuries. And usually they peak in a kind of a short time and then begin a decline. Obviously, the kingdom that is in power right now is in its decline, not in its ascendancy. So, um, yeah, let's just next highlight. Now, this one's interesting, and I don't entirely agree, which is why there's a green and followed by a red. He says, we have no crystal balls that allow us to glimpse the future. All we can hope to do is uncover a few trends and developments. Absolutely correct. Um, even biblical prophecy, which I do believe is sound. However, since I believe there's a lot of problems with the language as we understand it, I think there's a lot of problems with the way that a lot of people interpret it and oftentimes pass it off as this is, you know, this is absolutely correct. This is the best way to look at it. And they repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And their oftentimes unstudied audience just accept it as a fact. But besides for that, I do absolutely agree that this is true. This is one of the ways that we can, that somebody who is astute, that has the truth and has a good mind, can look at what's going on, can take the, uh, the good tools they have, which is a good understanding of what's going on and why, and they can apply that to the future. And usually they can predict and say, I predict that this thing or that thing or that thing's going to happen. Absolutely correct. He's right. The problem I have is when he goes on to say, uh, so if it is impossible to see into the future, the same should logically go for the past. This is where we encounter an impasse. That point I disagree with. I'm going to go to my note. What I said in my note, I just typed this just as we may predict with some degree of accuracy what may happen in the future, if we have good information, we should be able to sus to figure out what is most likely from the past. 
based on the same sort of reasoning. And, you know, the way this works is like this. Look, if we know who's in charge, now we may not, ha we may not have names, but if we can look and at least pinpoint pretty close to, in proximity to the who's running things and what their motives are, we can use that information to extrapolate backwards. The more information that we can gather in the present that's good solid information and apply it to what we think might happen in the future, the same thing can be done towards the past. We can apply this um, it's just like, okay, so you figure out um, for every action there should be a, you know, a certain reaction. If you apply that in your prediction of the future, you can apply that in your prediction of the past. And the way it works is like figure, um, like if we're talking about balls on a table, okay, a pool table, all the balls laid out on the table and you have a cue ball and you just send that cue ball spinning around the table. Um, if you were to begin a, a video of that cue ball going at a certain point and you followed its trajectory, say you gave it a, a good go and it did a lot, bounced a lot, it traveled a long way and it was able to interact with a number of, of balls on the table. You start the camera halfway through its journey. And only you probably only have to watch it one time uh, at its trajectory, hit a bumper, and continue in you know the trajectory once it hits its bumper. Then you're going to get a good idea for where it's going to go next and what it might interact with next. That's completely reasonable. In the same way, if you take its trajectory and you go backwards, let's say that when the video started, there were balls back here that were in a certain um, pattern, laid out in a certain way. You could probably figure, based on the trajectory you just saw, that it interacted with these over here and therefore it may have come from here started here with a certain amount of force interacted with this here and that put it on this trajectory you understand like because we have ways of being able to look into what's likely going to happen forward we should also be able to use that and look back so that's where um i don't entirely agree with what he's saying but to a degree he's right there is a certain amount um, of an impasse that we do come to simply because we're not there and a lot of the information that we get unless there is some way of really strongly corroborating any given claim then we have to regard it no matter how much we've ever heard it no matter how many people seem to uphold it as a fact we still if there's not enough good corroborating evidence and that is evidence based on let's say multiple testimonies of people that we know and can show wrote these things and did not have something to gain from lying about it we have to regard it simply as a story that may or may not be true. In that aspect, I entirely agree. Okay, so now here's where I take the sharp sort of rabbit trail. What he says in the next few paragraphs basically is pretty close to what I kind of just said in my, my talk here for the last few minutes. It's this point that I thought was really interesting. It made me check a few things. And I think it's a great illustration of, of how we can't just take anything. I'm sorry. I wish this wasn't the case. But we, we really can't just take any claim 
as for some reason it's it's just a given and I really don't understand why he does here and especially this one it's so odd and so bizarre that he treats it this way um, now in pointing this out and highlighting it I'm not um, per se criticizing this author um, but on this point I you know if it was me in retrospect when I looked at it I might have thought that that wasn't a good idea what he says is this he says um, let's take a, a look at an example of what I mean the English are said to have discovered Australia in 1770 it is a fact that English sailors discovered this continent but the date is open to question he writes it is a fact that English sailors discovered this continent he said and then he goes on he says at this time 1770 there were written records and the dates were given using four digit anyways he doesn't really make a case for why we should believe that English sailors discovered Australia other than we have claims but there we should look at the trajectory try to consider everything that was supposed to have been going on in the world at this time supposed to have been going on and see if we can look at that trajectory forward and backward and see if it makes sense that's all I'm saying so when I look at it I think about this 1770 well okay so supposedly uh, England was shipping their convicts to uh, Australia Let's see if we can go in here this is just a real short article um, why was Australia a chosen destination to ship convicts to okay um, it says uh, more than 160,000 that's a lot of ships more than 160,000 convicts were exiled to jails and harsh colonies on the far side of the world and that ain't no joke Australia where it sits based on all the maps we have and I'm not affirming the the veracity of the maps is on the other side of the world to England it's on the other side of the world to England it's very far to sail to Australia very very far no matter even if let's say the Suez was open because I have no reason to believe that the Suez was a recent canal. I think the Suez is an old canal, just like a lot of canals. Because we would have figured out a long time ago that it would be really good to put canals in certain strategic places. Anyways, even if that was open, that's a big trip. No matter which way you go, by boat, that's a very, very big trip um, they said um, they give you know a few uh, establishment figures uh, about um, why they sent them there Britain was struggling to accommodate its prisoners at home from the mid 18th century a soaring population combined with social disruptions brought about by the Industrial Revolution led to an increase in crime of course industrialization always leads to an increase in crime right an alternative punishment was needed and <laughs> transportation to colonies seemed to fit the bill <laughs> uh, at first British convicts were sent to the colonies in North America mm. but that option was halted by the American Revolutionary War which ended in 1783 so they say the government turned to the vast southern continent that had been claimed for Britain by the explorer Captain James Cook in 1770. And then, so they say the first fleet departed Britain in May uh, 1787. It's 11 ships carrying more than 700 convicts. It arrived in New South Wales, as Cook had named the territory the following year after a voyage of 252 days. 
a greater part of a year it would take. So that's a greater part of a year feeding even one ship full of sailors and prisoners. That's expensive. That's very expensive. Do you think logistically? Let's just look at it financially, logistically. Does it make sense? And to ship that many, the expense. Oh, that's amazing, the expense. There must have been, there must have been so much value in Australia, right? For them to do that. Now, remember, they're saying the reason they did that is because they had been shipping their convicts, which were predominantly made up of, of Irish and what they call them, you know, English uh, Yemeni, the common people who were different in tribe than the, uh, the rulers. They said they had been shipping them to the United States, but in 1783, the colonies won the, uh, the Revolutionary War, so, you know, they couldn't keep shipping them there. There's a problem with that, of course. There's a gigantic problem with that. But when I looked into Australia, I thought, well, Australia must just be absolutely teeming with these, these resources that they would just become rich if they sent them there as slaves um, to extract these resources. And when I looked into Australia, uh, it turns out most of Australia's economy today is in service. That's 70% of its economy. And even though it's said to lead the world in certain uh, mineral extraction and, and out shipping, um, when was that started? When did it become something that was so financially um, beneficial as to justify the enormous expense that it would have cost the British government to ship all of those convicts out there. And then you're talking about the expense of watching over them and making sure they don't get out of line, that they serve the crown in the way that you expect them to. We're looking at just massive expense for something that just doesn't appear to have any kind of good return. And now they say that the reason that they did that, of course, was because Britain finally conceded and lost this war with the colonies in 1783. And, of course, the big problem with that story is, if you look a little bit into um, the history of Britain in what we know today as Canada, which was, I guess, known back then as New France, so they say. The thing is that at that point in time, when they say they had to start shipping them all down halfway across the world, better part of a year to ship them, massive expense, and I don't really see that they were getting massive returns. Not just the expense of shipping, of course, the expense of housing, uh, of guarding them. <sighs> the problem is that even though Britain lost to the colonies, as the story goes, they still had New France. And it's closer to sail to than the American colonies. They still had what they call New France. They still had Canada. So, unless somebody can explain to me why, they would see that as something far more productive and financially feasible and so on and so forth. That story doesn't wash. However, one thing that I would like to leave you with as a consideration, I'm almost 45 minutes here. If the children of Israel and Judah had been carried away to the kingdom of Yun, as I speculate, based on evidence in bringing it all together, which would have been the eastern part of Asia, India, China, which China would have been Katim, at least parts of China, 
and even maybe even west of, of India, but a lot of it in the area of India and most of East Asia was at some time known as In, Yinde, or Yun. If many of them had been brought there, if many people had even migrated there, and you remember Katim was uh, a nation named after one of the grandsons of Noah too, and they were prophesied to carry away Asher and Odin, which were two large kingdoms to the north and northwest of Canaan, and which would have been the Israelites and Judahites. If they had, for the most part, been carried away to Asia and East Asia and India, it would be a small expense to transfer many of them down to Australia and New Zealand as compared to the massive expense with what doesn't appear to be a huge payout if they were brought there from England. So with that, I'm wrapping it up. Just a few thoughts. No huge points, but I hope a few points have sunk in. And once again, uh, thank you for the person that sent me. This is, uh, I always appreciate good resources that are helpful, and these are. So thanks again, and uh, see you all next time.